another question uh, from uh, from Valerie uh, from uh, London Valerie. Uh, but first, uh, I, I need to give it some background. Um, back in 2012, it was discovered that the police chief of South Bend, who was African American, had been taping phone conversations of senior police officers who were allegedly using racist language, in particularly racist language uh, about him. You demoted the police chief. No action was taken against the officers in question. Uh, London Valerie wants to ask about this. She's a freshman at Harvard from San Antonio. Great. London? Mayor, my question is straightforward. Yep. What are on the secret tapes regarding the demotions of South Bend's black police chief, Daryl Boykins? So the answer is I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that there, these tape recordings were made in a way that may have violated the Federal Wiretap Act. That's a federal law uh, that controls when you can and can't record people. And the allegation was that the police chief was using these recordings to try to figure out uh, what was going on with internal rivalries uh, with other police officers and allegedly uh, broke the Federal Wiretap Act when he did that. Uh, that's a law that's punishable by a term in prison. And so I'm not going to violate it, even though I want to know what's on those tapes like everybody else does. Right now, this is going through an incredibly long, frustrating, and expensive legal process that in the end will allow to, a judge to say whether or not the content of these recordings can be released so we can figure out whether it's true or whether it's not true that there's something on there that we need to be concerned about. Uh, the reason I demoted the chief was that I found out that he was the subject of a criminal investigation, not from him, but from the FBI. And it made it very hard for me to trust him as one of my own appointees. Uh, it was frustrating and painful too, though. He was the first African-American chief in our city's history. And one of the reasons I had asked him to serve in the first place in my administration was a great track record in community policing, which is a huge priority for us because we're a racially diverse community. And speaking of things you learn along the way, and in particular, lessons I learned the hard way as a mayor. One of the things I realized was that while uh, I was absorbed in just making sure that we weren't tripping on any landmines related to laws about what you can and can't record, I was, frankly, a little bit slow to understand just how much anguish underlay the community's response to this. Because for people in the community, it wasn't just about uh, whether we were right or wrong to be concerned about the Federal Wiretap Act. It was about whether communities of color could trust that police departments had their best interests at heart. And the more I learned about that, the more I realized that lifting the veil of mistrust between communities of color and our police department had to be one of my top priorities as mayor. It's why we instituted civil rights training and implicit bias training. It's why we implemented body-worn cameras for all of our officers. It's why we directed officers to make more foot patrols and get to know people in, in these neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods experiencing a lot of crime, not in an enforcement environment, but uh, in a trust building environment. And a number of other measures, including uh, stepping up our efforts to recruit more minority recruits onto the department itself, something I'm still not satisfied with what we've been able to do so far, so that there's more of that trust. Right, right now, I think it's five, the police force, the last statistic I saw in 2018 was 5% African-American, yeah. whereas the population is 26% exactly. African-American. Yeah. And, the, and the two police chiefs you hired subsequently, which uh, some people in the community criticize you for, were both white. One of the things we did uh, also as a response to learning about uh, how much concern there was in the community was making sure there was a community-oriented process to bring us input on the selection of the next police chief. Uh, and I believe that uh, we would not have been able to make those improvements without having uh, very qualified, good people come on board. But these are the challenges, whether it's, whether it's the relationship of, uh, uh, of communities of color to police departments or homelessness, housing, poverty. These are some of the toughest challenges in our country right now. And frankly, they're not problems that you solve overnight. But I believe they're problems that people with goodwill uh, and a listening heart are able to make progress on. And I don't think I would have been able to be reelected in uh, including winning minority districts in our city if it weren't for the very hard work that we did in the years since that incident really threatened to tear our city apart uh, to try to heal. And uh, I don't claim that we got every step perfect, but I will tell you that I did everything based on my best judgment and a desire to do what was right for the community. And I think we need that kind of spirit, that kind of attention, and frankly, that kind of willingness to listen and to adjust. We need a lot more of that in Washington right now, especially in the White House. Uh, one of the things, 
If you've been watching at home, you know we have a lot of folks from Harvard here and St. Elsom. Uh, we've been working with the Harvard Institute of Politics. Uh, they have a youth poll out. According to it, human rights is the top foreign policy issue for young voters. Uh, on that topic, Trevor Van Neel is a junior at New England College from Vermont. Trevor? Hello. Welcome back to New Hampshire. Thank you. My question is, how would you cooperate with countries that view homosexuality as a sin and a crime that is punishable by death? Well, I think it's wrong to harm or punish people because they're part of the LGBTQ community. I get that not every country is there. In some dramatically milder respects, but still very bothersome ones, our own country is not there. Uh, I believe that this is an example of why the world needs an America that is strong, that's credible, and that people believe keeps its word. Because frankly, our ability, the ability of the next president and of the US in general to lead on this issue, I mean, to really try to guide countries toward doing the right thing, largely depends on whether we have any moral authority at all. Does anybody think right now that the US has an awful lot of moral authority in the world? It has plummeted. And whether it's LGBTQ rights or frankly, any kind of, of human rights or democracy promotion that we want to advance, uh, either because we think it makes sense from an American perspective or just because we believe it, it's consistent with a universal aspiration for a better life. Uh, it's really important for the US to be a credible messenger. I still believe in, in the American model for all its flaws. When I look on the world stage, I think the American way of doing things, our commitment to freedom, our efforts, however imperfect, to establish a democratic society are, are the right way to go. And frankly, there's a lot of other models that are being held up now as credible alternatives. The Chinese model, authoritarianism in sheep's clothing, is being held up against the chaos and division of America right now. It's being held up as an alternative. The Russian model is throwing its weight around in nefarious ways that have harmed our country. Uh, don't even get me started on the Saudi model, right? There are a lot of other ways uh, that countries can operate. I still believe that America can spread values related to freedom and democracy that'll benefit, among other things, various minorities living in their home countries, but not if we're not credible, not if we're not viewed as a country that keeps its word. And uh, we've got to do better on that. And the next president uh, probably will make all the difference in this incredibly sensitive time in world affairs on whether we get into the rest of the 21st century with American leadership uh, continuing to be at the front of the pack or increasingly something people just scratch their heads over. I want to ask you just, uh, just a personal question if I can. At, in 2015 at 33 is when you came out publicly. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think your life would be different if you had come out before that? Uh, well, frankly, I came out because I wanted to date and <laughs> If dating had been available to me in my 20s, I'm not sure I would have got nearly as much done. Um, <laughs> I, you know, the, honestly, I don't know exactly. But uh, you know, what I do know is, is that at first I convinced myself that I didn't need much else in my life because I had a really demanding job, especially once I became mayor. I, I was mayor most of the time, and then I was uh, also a member of the reserve. Uh, that was more than enough to keep me busy. And the city was a jealous bride, and I was fine with that up to a point. Um, it was when I came back from my deployment, having taken time to serve in Afghanistan while mayor, uh, and I came back from that leave of absence, that I, I started really thinking about how you only get to live one life. And, uh, uh, and I came out, and I started dating, and, uh, and I found Chaston. And even though in the past I was mystified by the idea of how anybody, any of my fellow mayors or elected officials ever managed to do that job and also uh, be, be in relationships and be married, um, I don't know how I'd do this without him. So I guess another way to answer your question is uh, I would not be running for president today if I hadn't come out. I have no idea what would have happened if I had found a way to come out earlier in my life than I did.